Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Shri. Uh, today, I am going to be talking to you guys about building uh, a compiler to create executable microprocess service flows using just Cypher. Uh, so I'm going to start with, so this entire, the entire talk has been structured as a case study. So everything that I'm going to be talking to you about really happened. Uh, this isn't just an idea. Um, it's something that was implemented, and I'll be talking through those things as well. But the way the story began um, is, I think, uh, not very unique, But I, because I feel like at this point, uh, given the state of the industry, a lot of people have gone through uh, this transformation into microservices. So when I was first introduced to microservices, this is a little bit like what the future looked like to me. Um, the sales pitch to me was, oh my god, it's going to be perfect fault domain isolation, you're going to have independent team velocities and stability, scalability, all these things. Uh, but uh, you know, a few years into actually doing it, uh, I kind of felt like this is what it ended up looking like. Um, the consistency model was not thought about deployment, provisioning, et cetera, et cetera. So one of the things that became uh, quite challenging, uh, and this is where our case study begins today, uh, is I used to work for a financial underwriting, uh, a financial firm. And so one of the things that uh, the financial firm does uh, when, when it wants to give out money, uh, understandably, is underwrite the incoming customer. So there are predictive models that get built out by analysts. Uh, there are uh, thresholds and cost optimizations that the business does, uh, sometimes strategy operations. Uh, there are reports that business intelligence produces. And ultimately, all this is built by a bunch of engineers. Right? So there are like four different personas, uh, but there's just one process. Um, but the number of teams working on this is quite a few, actually, because there are four different personas. So one thing that we realized as we went into microservices was that there were more than one teams involved, and that made the collaboration fairly difficult. And more importantly, it became more and more difficult to understand how exactly things were happening because the logic was sharded out into so many small places. So it all begins like this, right? So here is an example of a very simple uh, flow chart that one of our product people came up with, right? And typically, it's made by a product person, right? So you take some input. You end up like first purchasing some market data for the person you want to underwrite. You do some analytics. Uh, it, based on that analytics, if uh, you need to do more analytics, then uh, you end up buying more data, and then you do some more analytics. And either way, you end up making a decision, and you get some output. Right? This is a fairly uh, like simple like uh, underwriting flowchart uh, that product people uh, come up with. Except there's one problem with this flowchart. In fact, there's one problem with pretty much every flowchart. Right, which is it does not clearly represent the full intent. Because if we think of graphs, uh, because that's what this is, a flowchart, there are two planes to the graph. There is the control flow and the data flow. And the problem with flowcharts is that it only ever visualizes control flow. In other words, we don't know exactly how the data is flowing from node to node. Uh, in this example, for instance, if condition was true, right, which is this condition right here, uh, should there be any data coming out of the first analysis that we want to use in the ultimate decision that we make? That part is not clearly represented in this flowchart. So this was the flowchart and in implementation, it actually ends up looking like this, uh, which is you take some input and then there is like a product microservice, which ends up calling a data microservice, which is the one that buys all the data. It might call an analysis microservice, which does like, you know, runs models and things like that. It might call a decision microservice. Uh, which is where we'll make the ultimate decision. And as you can see, there's a lot of back and forth because in reality or in implementation, when we implement it, those data edges are going to show up, right? So in other words, if you look at this flowchart and if you look at this actual implementation, they actually don't look very much like each other because the flowchart ends up hiding that uh, data layer in its representation. So this is not where it ends, unfortunately, in fact. Right. If eventually, what ends up happening is people leave the company. There is churn, inevitably. There is rotation. Um, we might write some documentation. But obviously, since we have written the documentation, 
things have changed. Uh, so really, most of the times, the documentation is just wrong, and people just end up disagreeing or having conflicts about it. And worst of all, the new person who is running the show does not understand why it's so difficult to just understand what exists and then add some new functionality to it, right? And eventually, you're left with an engineer, typically somebody who looks like that. That's typically me in most cases, uh, who is just trying to put it all together, uh, talking to different teams, trying to come up with a mental model uh, just to explain what's going on because a picture like this does not exist anywhere, right? So teams tried or turned to different options. So one option that we tried was uh, our, the service mesh thing sounds interesting. Should we go buy one of those? And we tried. And what we ended up with was a fully connected graph. Uh, because typically, uh, most likely, everything calls everything. And it's not really giving us more insight because uh, service meshes don't it's very it's not impossible but hard to get service meshes to work at the level of a single business process flow right while all this was happening we had a couple of realizations right so the first realization is if we took these domains this product service data service decision service and analysis service um and just looked at them um at the boundary of each one of those services we were doing the same thing over and over again, right? Like, which was we were writing the same integration code, which is make an HTTP call, make an RPC call, whatever it is, over and over again, because ultimately that that piece of code has to happen at every boundary because we're crossing some sort of boundary, right? Um, the other thing that we realized is that while there is churn inside the services, that is like, you know, we might be adding new reports in the future, uh, we might be changing the models, but a lot of times the graph itself, the flow chart itself ends up going through a lot of reconfiguring, right? In fact, changing that orchestration happens just about as often as we are changing the logic within the bound within the boundaries of each of these microservices. And another thing that we realized, specifically in the domain of financial underwriting, was that a lot of the contracts, right? That is, a lot of the um, the data flowing between these uh, boundaries typically tended to be unstructured and ad hoc, right? And more importantly, it tended to churn or change over time. So, with these realizations, if we looked at this flowchart that we had in a different way, instead of looking at it as this implementation, if we instead looked at it as a graph, we start to see something more interesting, right? Like, first of all, if we looked at this graph in two different layers, first in the layer of the data plane and second in the layer of the control plane, the first thing that we see is that it's much more intent revealing, much more explicit, right? Because we can see exactly where the data flows from which node or from which boundary service, call it whatever you want, bounded context to which bounded context. And then secondly, it's pretty easy for us to separate out the data flow from the control flow to say, hey, we only do this based on some condition coming out of this, right? So this is a very explicit, clear model of thinking about the exact same problem which a simple flowchart does not do, right? So after this realization, we came up with a problem statement, right? And the problem statement was this. I want a language or a protocol for the collaborative authoring of detailed executable architecture diagrams. In other words, if anyone can make this and anyone can change this, as long as the code for each of these bounded contexts is written and available in some sort of artifact, whether it be a binary or a lambda, it doesn't matter, container, why cannot anyone be able to author these business process flows without having to involve four different personas from four different teams? In other words, what if we just made a language which made it possible for us to create intention-revealing graphs which ended up just becoming executable architecture diagrams or executable documentation, essentially. And so that is the problem statement that we're talking about, or that we're starting out with, right? So the first thing that we want to do is kind of separate out these two concepts, right? So we have these bounded contexts or these nodes, uh, and the nodes represent logical actions, like I said, with 
varying physical implementations. They can be implemented, like I said, by lambdas, by containers. It's a, just a binary. It's an artifact that, that can be executed. They're just logical actions, right? So when we read purchase data one, uh, it tells us what it does, but we don't really need to know how it does it because that's contained within the context. And that's the point of a microservice if you think about it, right? The edges, the blue edges in this case are the data edges and the red edges are the control edges. And they represent multiplexed data and control flow, which is they represent how data and control flows between these nodes. And, and finally, if we can standardize on an interchange format, for example, JSON, right? Then we have the ability to make something like a language where it is possible for us to author these diagrams that just become documentation that is executable, right? To do that, we need to come up with a language, right? And this is the language that we came up with, right? So everything is a step, right? Like all the, all the, the blue nodes that represent logical actions, those are steps, right? So a step, a step, a step, right? And steps have data coming out of them, which gets mapped into variables that end up feeding other steps. Steps are executed by certain resources. This is the physical implementation of this logical action. And steps can also be blocked by other steps. This is it. This is the entire taxonomy that we need in order to be able to do that thing that we set out to do, the, the ability to build executable microprocess flows in, in Cypher, right? So here are some definitions. So a resource, right, is just a physical implementation of a logical step. Think lambda, binary, whatever it is. A variable is just a named piece of data or datum accepted as input by a step. So a step can take multiple variables, right, and it has a name. Um, the executes edge is, the relationship that depicts the execution of a step by a resource, an executor. Uh, the map edge maps data into variables. The feed edge feeds data from variables into steps. Uh, the block edge basically blocks steps behind other steps based on some sort of logic, and we'll get to how that is implemented in a second. And one thing to note is that block blocking is inherently cascading, which is if there is a step blocked by another step, and the blocks relationship fails, then steps that derive from this step will also consequently not be executed because this step was blocked to begin with, right? And, and then finally, there's a step itself, which is the logical representation of a unit of work, right? So these are the definitions of, of these uh, entities. Now, here are some properties, right? Like, and these are just actual key value properties on these entities. So resources, can have something like an ARN. If you're using like lambdas on uh, AWS, it can be an HTTP endpoint, it can be a container address, it's up to you, right? Uh, and usually that's just the address of the binary to call. The variable just has a name, which is the name of that variable being fed in. Uh, executes as an environment uh, in which it's being executed. So if we go back to this, you can see that there can be multiple executes for a single step. And that is just used to separate the environments that, that logical uh, unit runs in, uh, maps, maps data from one step to another. And it has this, this path, which is just a, another language like JSON path or James path, which allows you to parse out the JSON to select just the bit of data that you want from the output of the previous step to feed into the variable that feeds the next step. Feeds has no properties, blocks, uses the same concept of JSON or James path to return a Boolean expression that can be used to gate the execution of a downstream step. And a step has a name, and the name is the logical representation of what it does. This can be used in Neo4j to create pretty much any process graph. Uh, and I'm just, I, I just had a toy example of some input being fed to a veggie node and a fruit node, it doesn't matter what we do with this. The fact that it was used for financial underwriting was just coincidence. It was just the first place where it started, but it's just a graph representing process flow. And we can do, we can use that graph to represent any process flow. It just so happens that the one we're starting with is financial underwriting. So if we take that primitive that we talked about, which is this one, and extrapolated it, we can create, as we can see, 
any graph. We can represent any graph because that is a primitive, right? And that simple primitive pattern can be repeated an arbitrary number of times to represent any process graph, including the one that we set out, the, the financial underwriting one that we set out to, uh, to, to graph, right? So with the introduction of this language, we have now created the ability for us to author detailed architecture diagrams. None of this, uh, it's, it's not a language. We're, we have just come up with a taxonomy. A language or a protocol requires some way to enforce these rules. And that's where we start having Cypher come in, right? So the first step we need to police these rules uh, to, to check that the taxonomy is correct is a lexer, right? And the lexer just uses a bunch of properties uh, or theorems uh, to check that all the uh, criteria are met. For example, here are some of the truths or axioms that are postulated and checked using Cypher. For example, a step must have a unique UUID string property. Every step must be fed by at least one variable. Uh, every variable that feeds a step must be unique to that step, so on and so forth. There are about 27 to 35 of those that we came up with, right? And there are some product level properties that can be introduced that are not in the core language, right? But once we have this, if we just run these 27 to 35 truths, which are just cipher queries, right? We can check that the graph that has been made by someone adheres to this taxonomy that we came up with, right? And that is the beginning of a language, right? We have a language, we have a protocol because it is enforced, because it's checked, right? So we can author these detailed diagrams because remember, we split the control flow, the data flow, we can control exactly which bit of information we want going from which step. We can parse it out using JSON or JAMESPOT. Um, and then we're checking all of that using that uh, the, the Cypher language, using, some, using those truths that I was talking about but it's still not executable. To execute it, we need a compiler, right? Turns out it's actually not hard to build one because all a compiler does is it takes that language and changes that into a representation that can be understood by some engine at runtime. That, that's all a compiler is, right? If you think about uh, even something as simple as like a C compiler or a Java compiler, they are just producing binary or bytecode that uh, your OS or your JVM can interpret. So all the compiler is doing in this case, again, just a simple cipher query, which is going to take that graph, which has been lexed, which has been checked for all those truths, all these, including the fact that it must be a DAG, a directed acyclic graph, and it's going to run this cipher query, which produces a JSON reduction of that graph, which can be ingested by an execution engine to then execute those directives, right? So when we run that cipher query, and, and uh, to talk about the cipher query very briefly, all the cipher query does is it pattern matches, right? And it's very easy to do because it's the same pattern that's being repeated over and over again. So if you read the beginnings of the cipher query, I haven't written all of it, but if you read the beginnings of the cipher query, uh, that's all it's doing, right? Like it's pattern matching that primitive over and over again until it can compile all of the entire graph into JSON that looks something like this, which can serve as directives for an execution engine to interpret. Right? And what it produces, actually, is just an array of JSON objects, one for each of the steps in the graph. And what, that, what, what each of those JSON objects describe is their relationships, their contracts with their peers, which is just a fancy way of saying an adjacency matrix. Right? It's an adjacency matrix with properties represented in JSON. That, that's all it is. Right? And so if you look at it, it says, look, uh, output. Uh, from the step has to go to this step and it feeds these variables. And here is the path that we have to use to parse out the output. Here is where it gets its input from. Here are the things that it blocks. Here, is the, here are the things it's blocked by. Here are the physical implementations, the binaries, the arms, whatever it is that implement these steps, right? So it's just distilling the graph into some sort of representation that can be eaten by, a, by an execution engine. 
And all the execution engine is, is something that reads that compiled JSON artifact and can execute those directives. And that can be written in any language you want. Uh, it, the input is going to be JSON. It can be, it can be not JSON. You can choose whatever representation you want. We just chose JSON because it just plays well with Cypher and being able to spit all this out, key value pair based. Um, but it can be any language. And all it has to do is interpret that artifact, which has all these directives for, hey, don't execute this step until this step is done because it depends on this data. And once that step is done, uh, you know, please parse out this piece of information from this step, call it this, and feed it to this step. But then once this step is done, please parse out this, and then wait for this step, and parse out this and this, and feed all that into this step. And also, this step can't run until some criteria are met from these. And if those criteria are not met, then this step cannot run, even if the data is available. These are all just interpretations of these directives represented or expressed by the graph. Right? And the net result is just a simple reusable orchestrator or an execution engine that can take any arbitrary compiled graph which adheres to that language, that protocol that we defined, checked by those compiler or lexers, truths, or axioms, and it executes it. And so this is kind of what it looks like. right? So we have somebody who authors this graph. It gets lexed that is checked for correctness based on those axioms that we talked about. Then it gets compiled into JSON, which then gets fed into an engine that just executes this graph, essentially. right? So it's an unbroken chain from creation to execution. Here, it serves as the, uh, the source of truth or documentation for representing what is going on. But that is exactly also what is being executed. right? So now we have fulfilled some more of this problem statement. So we have a language or a protocol that can be authored in a detailed manner, and it can be executed. Right? The only bit that we're missing is collaboration. Right? So there are multiple ways to go about this, but we took the easiest route. And, and that route was once the graph is created, that is, once this JSON has been compiled, if I want to change it, there are two ways to go about doing it. I can make this database, this Neo4j database, where I compiled all of this persistent uh, and have permissions and have multiple people trying to edit it, et cetera, which is going to be a little bit of an administration nightmare, uh, especially at the stage of infancy that we were at in the adoption of Neo4j. Or I can just call this JSON my source of truth at this point. Because once it's compiled, this JSON is immutable. If we want to change it, we would have to decompile this JSON into a graph, edit it, and recompile it into a new version. And for that, we wrote a decompiler. It's actually way simpler than it sounds, because all the decompiler does is what the compiler does in reverse. Right? The compiler looked for patterns and compiled them into JSON snippets. The decompiler takes those JSON snippets and just reverts them into simple patterns using just simple merge, match, and create statements. right? And the output is just Cypher, which reconstructs the graph. And because the primitive is just that very simple pattern that we saw all the way back here, it's not that hard because it's just compiled into a series of JSON snippets, which can just be simply reverse engineered into the creation of these nodes and edges. right? And that's exactly what the decompiler does. And so once we have a decompiler, I now have a feedback loop where I can author a graph, lex it, compile it, version it, and put it into some sort of storage, right? where it is now an immutable artifact which can be run by the execution engine. And if I want to change it, I can pull it down, decompile it, reauthor, edit the graph, relex it, recompile it, create a new JSON version, save that, version that, and now I can edit, I can execute the new version which will have the new changes, right? And this is a very simple way we found to collaborate on the creation of these flows. right? And, and that's it. That's the entire uh, problem statement. So we created a language or a protocol by using a lexer that forces the taxonomy on the graph by running a few handful of checks. Then we compiled it using a compiler into a JSON artifact and then built an execution engine 
that can interpret the directives for that JSON or sorry in that JSON artifact to execute that microprocess or uh, microservice flow. And if you ever wanted to change it, we built a decompiler that allows us to bring it down, make the cipher again, edit it, recompile it, and keep doing that thing as many times as we want, and hence collaborate on it, right? And a couple of things we realized in building this is that once we stop thinking of the microprocess or sorry, microservice process flow as a flow chart and instead start thinking about it as a graph, we got a few freebies, right? First, because the representation is so explicit, because there is nothing implicit about which data is flowing from which node to which node we get inherent parallelism without having to think about it, right? If this step has dependencies on both these steps because it needs a blocking condition from here, but then needs data from here, then of course, this step is gated behind the execution of both these steps. However, both these steps are not do not have any dependencies between each other, which means that for all intents and purposes, they can be executed in parallel, and they do get executed in parallel if implemented correctly in the execution engine, right? The other freebie uh, that we get, which is fairly important and was kind of baked into this problem statement, was the document. The, the compiled graph is also now living documentation, right? In other words, if we go here, because this is an entire closed chain system. There is no way to execute something that isn't represented in this graph because the execution is literally an execution of this graph, which means that there is no way where we can have the, the code or the documentation for the code diverge, right? Or the documentation go out of date. And so because now we have the, the compile graph, the living documentation, it is always maintained and impossible to make stale. Right. Um, there are some limitations, and one of the limitations that we uh, ended up hitting upon is that a lot of people still think in flowcharts and and not in graphs. And what that means is one thing that we saw. So if we go back all the way to where we created the initial inception flowchart, which is this thing, people are very used to thinking like this. And the, and the problem with that is that people end up conflating control and data all the time uh, in that they don't think of the graph in multiple layers. So when, when we tried exposing people at the beginning to this concept of divorcing the concept of control from the concept of data, thinking of the graph in two different layers where control just controls which step gets executed after which step. And, and in reality, if we think about what that represents, Usually, we don't want to execute some steps because they either cost money or they cost time or they cost some sort of ir irreversible operation that we do not uh, that we do not want happening based on some conditions, right? So that's why that edge is called control or block. And so, if we think of just the nodes that need that separately from the data flow, that's when we can start unlocking without thinking about the fact that we want to unlock that kind of parallelism parallelism in the graph, right? So in other words, if we just think the way microservices were made uh, or the, 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 the architectural pattern of microservices were created, uh, that is, we think in bounded context uh, and, the, and the data flow and the control flow between those bounded contexts, then, then we should be in good shape. However, that's not how people think inherently. People like to think in flowcharts because we've just been so used to it. And so what we have seen happen is that people end up creating essentially blocking edges between everything because that rep, that is the closest representation they have to a flowchart, right? Some of the value adds we got from this is that once we have that execution, we can always trace that execution to create all these value adds like distributed request tracing, performance tracing, error tracing, replay semantics, metrics, automated API documentation, Right? And all because we have this single primitive that allows us to represent our intent clearly and has a language that forces us to, to, to be consistent in how we create these orchestration flows. Finally, in terms of adoption and performance, um, this was created in circa 2018. 
And we found that this was the fastest adopted internal product uh, in the company's history. And here are some statistics. Um, and I will take some questions when I have the chance in the panel. <laughs>